Okay. Well, welcome to Flow with the Grow. And um, first, thank you for coming on and um, sharing your knowledge and expertise. I um, got connected with you through, I don't know if it, he's your friend or someone that you work with, but he reached out a long time ago and just life happened. And then I reached back out when life kind of slowed down a little bit. So thank you for still coming on though. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. It's uh, one of my favorite topics to talk about. Love that. Awesome. So first, I would love if you could just explain more about who you are and what you do. Sure. Uh, my name is Igor. I'm the author of uh, seven books on exercise and nutrition. Um, here are a few. Here's uh, Stop Exercising the Way You Are Doing It Now, um, High Blood Pressure Reversal Secrets, The Mental Health Prescription, Type 2 Diabetes Reversal Secrets, and a few others that I have with me <laughs> right now. Um, as well, I run a uh, personal training company both here in the greater Toronto area, as well as virtually online. So we work with uh, clients in the in the US, UK, um, Canada, of course, and, and others. So that's kind of what I do in a nutshell. Awesome. How did you get started with health and fitness and doing what you do? Uh, well, how much time do you have? <laughs> um, the, the short version is when uh, I was in high school, um, my parents wanted me to be a computer programmer, uh, which is funny because I have zero aptitude or interest in technology. I'm usually like the last one to adopt a new technology. The only reason I don't have a rotary phone anymore is because they don't make them anymore. Um, so zero aptitude or interest for, uh, interest for technology, but I did compete in martial arts when I was uh, in elementary school and high school. Um, I found myself spending my free time reading about, you know, um, exercise, endurance, flexibility, strength, power, et cetera. Um, and eventually went into kinesiology university um, and, start, and all throughout undergrad, I was working as a personal trainer and then continued working as a trainer um, after graduated from uh, with my bachelor's and, uh, and kept on going through uh, throughout. And it's been almost 16 years so far. Wow. That's amazing. Thank what's you. your, what's your favorite part about training? Um, seeing life change. Yeah, so for sure. it's very cool for me. Um, it, and it's funny earlier in my career, I really wanted to work with athletes. Um, and it's, I mean, it's, it, don't, don't, don't get me wrong. It's cool to get somebody to go a little bit faster, be a little bit stronger, um, run a little bit farther, et cetera. But it, to me, it's, it's more rewarding when I can actually add years to someone's life. And that's, that's not exaggeration. It's not hyperbole. Literally, if you get somebody's blood sugar, <laughs> Uh, from high to normal, you're you're adding between one and three years to their life, uh, not just not just years to their life, but life to their years. The later part of their of their life will be spent um, in fewer hospitals, fewer doctors' visits, um, more time with the grandkids, great grandkids, etc. Um, so it's just cool to see quality of life improve. But uh, and I know in the fitness industry we overuse this term, but literally be life changing. Yeah, it's so true. I know for me training, my, like my clients, I worked at a gym called Anytime Fitness and um, kind of moving my business to online now. But one of the, my favorite things is seeing their, like how their life has changed in their daily life. It's so rewarding. And then also just seeing how it can impact in a year from now, two years from now. So yeah. I love that. And not just how it impacts them, but also the people around them, their kids, yeah. their grandkids, their parents, their friends, et cetera. Yes, exactly. Has there ever been a point in your journey where, or even in the very beginning, where you had a lot of challenges or struggles and it's helped you to help other people, like a kind of a specific challenge that you ever faced? Uh, challenges from a from marketing perspective or challenges from a perspective of um, like help, helping a client? Yeah, I would say helping a client, like any personal struggles that you had in your fitness journey or health journey or anything like that. Yeah, tons. And that's what gets me to want to learn and grow. And that that's what makes me super, super curious. Um, like, for instance, when I was first starting out, I was working in a, in a country club where the majority of my clients were um, middle-aged uh, middle ladies going through menopause within five, 10 years of menopause. And the very basic training of personal training doesn't really prepare you for that kind of, of situation. Um, so I had really, I really had to put my thinking cap on and figure out, well, why isn't the traditional stuff that I learned working with this group of people? Um, so then I dug deep into hormones, digestion, stress, like what happens at that time in a woman's life, um, to get me to, to figure out, well, how do I make that group of people to make progress? Um, then I had a client who's a diabetic, um, and I knew in general what to do with them, but I didn't know specifically the best thing to do because we can spend an hour doing a good thing 
or we can spend an hour doing the best thing. It's still an hour, but why don't we maximize that hour? Um, optimize what we can do during that period of time. So again, I got curious. Uh, I started looking around and well, there's not a single great website that talks about this. There's not a single certification that certifies people in uh, specific, specifically working with diabetics. So I went to the uh, medical literature and did my own research um, and I created that certification. Um, so it's those clients uh challenges that i'm like this i mean i generally speaking know how to work with this person but not like what's the best thing and like i said I mean, in my, my my mindset is we can spend an hour doing a good thing or we can spend an hour doing the best thing why don't we like figure out the best thing we can do in that time so uh, and, and it still to this day there's more challenges coming uh that make me super curious super interested in learning how do i solve that problem the best way possible yeah, I love that. I love that you went out and did your own research and even wrote a book on it and created a certification. Um, and I think that it helps the client too to understand and us all fitness trainers and professionals to understand that there's a lot more going on than just, well, I need to lose weight. Well, there's hormones. If you have high blood pressure and then doing things that's going to tailor to helping that issue that's going on. Yeah, exactly. Like I said, you can do a good thing or you can do the best thing. Yes. Okay, so for today's topic, I really wanted to talk about starting a health and fitness journey. Um, this will be released in the new year. And so we have all of those New Year's resolutions and people wanting to start a gym membership and wanting to lose weight and get healthier and whatever it may be. So my first question is, if someone is at that point right now, they're wanting to get healthy, they're wanting to make a change, what would be, in your opinion, step number one? Step number one, make it specific. Because um, a lot of people will say, I want to get in the best shape of my life. What does that mean to you, though? Um, and how do you define best shape? Is it by a clothes size? Is it by how much you weigh? Um, is it more of a performance-oriented metric? Is it the amount of miles you can run? The, the amount of time you can run X number of miles in? Um, is it a strength-oriented thing? How much weight you can lift in a specific exercise? So make it very, very specific. Uh, that's one. And two, make it realistic. Um, if you have no reference of what's realistic, like how much weight could you lose? How much endurance could you improve? How much strength could you gain? Um, ask somebody who does know or look it up online, um, but make it realistic. And this is contrary to a lot of self-help um, um, advice, but make the goal small, uh, make the goal small. Um, in other words, if you want to lose a hundred pounds, don't set the goal of losing a hundred pounds, make set the goal of losing one pound. Um, this way, uh, the, the idea is to build up small successes. You want to feel successful as opposed to unsuccessful. If you set the goal of losing 100 pounds, well, that's a giant goal. It's very admirable. And if you have 100 pounds to lose, absolutely, go ahead and, 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 and make that goal. Um, but all you should think about is just, just that first pound. If you do that first pound, you're successful. You want to go for the second pound. If you do the second pound, you're successful. You want to do the third pound. However, if you set the goal of 100 pounds, you lose five pounds and it takes you three weeks and you're like, well, that's not on track for, for a year's worth of a hundred pounds in a year. So you feel unsuccessful. You do your first binge and then you gain back the five pounds and maybe six or seven or eight. Uh, so you feel unsuccessful. So set very, very small goals that make you feel successful. But also I want to distinguish between outcome goals versus uh, behavior goals. Outcome goals is, for example, losing a hundred pounds or losing 10 pounds or whatever, whatever the weight is. Um, you can't control that. You can't control your weight. You can, you can influence your weight, but you can't control it. There's other things that impact your weight besides just your nutrition, hormonal cycles, uh, how much salt you had the day before, two days before. So there are other things that impact your weight besides your nutrition. Nutrition is a big one and it has a giant influence, but not perfect control. What you should uh, set your goals on is behaviors. You can 100% control your behaviors. So an example of a behavior would be, I want to have three servings of vegetables per day. Um, and there's a, a distinct metric. You either did it or you didn't do it. Um, and if you didn't do it, uh, either make the goal easier. Maybe you want to have two instead of three. Maybe you want to have one instead of instead of two. Uh, just make it so easy that you're consistently hitting that success marker. Um, or maybe if you're not hitting it, what maybe it's not desirable by you. Maybe it's not meaningful enough to you. So um, I encourage people to set more... Um, more beha more behavior goals as opposed to outcome goals. Now, if you're working with a professional, the nutritionist, a personal trainer, or somebody else, they can monitor the other goals, the outcome goals. But um, you shouldn't set your uh, your outcome goals based on something that's not in in 100% control for you. Yes, I love that. 
especially when you said setting small goals, because I think that that's, that helps the client or who, you know, whoever's wanting to reach that goal and helps them to set themselves up for success right away. Um, exactly. I remember when I worked at the gym and I had a client and we were setting goals. I wanted to help them also set behavior goals, which I think is very crucial. And, uh, and I would say, you know, if your goal is five days a week for working out, but if they maybe have never worked out before, we would have an honest conversation. And I would just encourage them to consider thinking about maybe setting that goal for two days a week. Because if you know you for sure will go two days a week, then you reach that goal. It feels good. And if you go three days a week, then it's just like you've maximized or you've, you know, uh, reached that goal even further. And so then it feels good. Um, what about if someone has, like, what would you say about if someone hits a setback in their fitness journey in the new year? What, what could they do? One thing I often preach is that there is no failure. There's only feedback and there's only data. Um, and I often tell the story of Thomas Edison. By the way, I'm not sure how true the story is, but it's, I, I like the, the overall lesson of the story. Uh, when Thomas Edison was inventing the light bulb, um, it said that he tried 10,000 times and failed 10,000 times before he invented the light bulb on number 10,001. Um, so when the media approached him and asked him, didn't you get discouraged after 10,000 failures? Well, Thomas Edison responded, I didn't see it as 10,000 failures. I saw it as I figured out 10,000 ways to not create a light bulb. So just keep going. So figure out number number 10,001. Maybe that will be the one that will create the light bulb. Same thing here. You can try something and you have to treat it as a scientific experiment. When you're going to a scientific experiment, you have to be unbiased. You don't care what the outcome is. I mean, you can hope what the outcome is, but you know, you shouldn't care. Um, and if it if it works, awesome you're getting to your goals. If it doesn't work, well, you learn something about how what you shouldn't do. So then do what I call a post-mortem to analyze why it didn't it work. Was it too ambitious? Is, was it too, too difficult to do? Was it too, too time consuming? Um, am I just not that interested in it? Um, and then figure out what's what's the simplest thing you can change to, to get there. And maybe with two, three, four iterations, um, what used to be impossible is now normal, mundane. Yeah, I love that concept. I don't know if I've heard of that story before. I think I might have, but that's something that it's, it's cool. It changes the mindset, it changes the perspective of things. And then it kind of changes the feel of it as well. So I like that a lot. Yeah. yeah I'm not, I'm running experiment is the, is the mindset that we're going into this with. Mm -hmm. Yes. So once someone has set small, they're specific, uh, realistic, and they're setting some small goals surrounding their behaviors, what would be the next step after that? Like they've got that down, what can they do next? Next is value the results. So Winston Churchill once said, no matter how elegant the methods, occasionally you have to, to look at the results. Are the behaviors getting you the results that you want? And if they are, can you amplify those behaviors? If you're already eating vegetables twice per day, what if you did it three times per day? Um, or if you're already like max, like I don't want another vegetable, I'm good with like two or three a day. What else can you do? Can you drink more water? Can you eat more protein? Can you go for a walk? Can you lift weights? Um, like what else can you add that is enjoyable, uh, desirable, uh, something that you look you would look forward to doing as opposed to something that's dreadful mm -hmm. that you should do, but you dread. Right. Yeah. And then what would be kind of some red flags or things to avoid in the new year in 2022, things that people can avoid? Um, one thing to avoid is uh, one of the mistakes I mentioned earlier is setting outcome-based goals. You can have a big goal as an outcome, but break it down into specific behaviors uh, that would make it achievable. If the goal is to lose 20 pounds, make the, be the desired behavior, for instance, and this is not a prescription per se, um, eat more vegetables. And, and then again, set how much more, uh, how much you're eating right, right now so that you're eating more than that. The model is progress, not perfection. So one and another obstacle to avoid is setting gigantic goals, uh, set tiny goals um, so that they're very achievable and they're very, very easy to hit. Um, another mistake to avoid is not having an accountability partner. Have somebody that you can be accountable to, whether that's a friend, a parent, a child, a personal trainer, a nutritionist. Um, and there's even websites that have accountability partners who you might not know. Um, so have an, account uh, an account accountability partner. Um, if you think about any area of your life where you're successful, might be your finances, might be your parenting, might be you're a great, great gardener, uh, maybe you're a great 
piano player or a violin player, just think about an area of your life where you're successful. Copy though, uh, copy what made you successful in that area to let's say health and fitness. So if you, let's say somebody is very successful at their career. Well, what got them successful? Well, probably academically, they were pretty good because they had a mentor. Uh, the mentor might have been a professor, might have been a teacher's assistant, might have been a classmate who was maybe a step or two ahead of them. Um, so that was our accountability partner. If you apply that to dieting or healthy eating or, um, or exercise, um, you're gonna be way more likely to stick with it than if you have nobody, uh, nobody to be accountable to. Uh, so those are some of the biggest mistakes to avoid in the new year. Just approach it in a different way than you've ever done before. Yeah, that's a good point. Approach it differently than you've ever done before. And I think accountability is super important. We're just, we're a lot more likely to give up on ourselves versus if we have someone or multiple people that we're, you know, held accountable to. We're a yeah. lot less likely to want to give up on someone else. Yeah. And there's one strategy that I call self-blackmail. Um, quick story in the 1980s, I think in 83 or 84, there was a man named John Bear. Um, he wrote a book called the black male diet forever. He wanted to lose, I think it was 70 or 80 pounds, something like that, but he drop a few and then gain a few, drop a few, gain a few, and he never really lost it. So he had to blackmail himself into losing the weight. So what did he do? Well, he took aside uh, a significant amount of money. I don't remember the exact amount. I think it might've been 10,000. Um, and put it into escrow. Um, and he made a contract with himself. Basically, if he doesn't um, hit the desired weight loss, that money would be donated to a neo-Nazi organization. Now, he did not want to support a neo-Nazi organization, so he lost the weight. So he blackmailed himself. Uh, now, you could use that same concept to help you. Um, for instance, if, you, um, if you're a liberal, put money to go to a conservative party. If you're conservative, put money to go to a liberal party. Uh, just put money, um, a significant amount of money that would hurt if you lost it. Um, it has to be significant enough that you feel you don't want to lose that money. Uh, it's more valuable to, to you to keep the money than to, um, than to not achieve the goal. Um, that's one example. But another example uh, would be to tell five other people, who ideally five people who you spend the most time with about your goal. This way, these, I mean, maybe it's your coworkers, maybe it's your friends, maybe it's your family, um, so that if they know about your goal and they're asking you on a daily or weekly basis, hey, how's it going with, you know, filling your goal? You'd be a little bit embarrassed to say, it's not going so good. I fell off the bandwagon. Um, and it also enlists their social support and accountability. So that's another thing you can do. Um, a lot of people will say post on social media and that's okay. That's, that's maybe a little bit of a bonus, but... Uh, nobody on social media is committed to checking up on you on a regular basis. Whereas five, the five people you spend the most time with, uh, they're going to be way more likely to ask you how that goal is doing. Um, and there's even a web, there's even websites for self blackmail if you want to take that route. Um, I don't know if I can list websites here. Uh, so the one, one website is, and I have no affiliation with them, is stick.com. S-T-I-C-K-K.com, uh, where you do exactly that. You put money to escrow to donate to a cause, organization, a political party that you don't like if you don't achieve your goal. Um, so accountability goes a long way. And this is one example of radical accountability. <laughs> that's a great, yeah, that's a great incentive to put money towards something you don't want to contribute yeah. towards to help you with staying accountable to reaching your goals. I never thought about them before. Very cool. Do you ever have um, clients who struggle with consistency? Like, I just know when I used to work at the gym, we would get a lot more people, a lot more members, a lot more people in training, but then eventually they would slowly fall off and not come back or they would slowly quit on themselves. So how do you help your clients or other people to stay consistent for like for life and not quit yeah. on themselves? Uh, part of it, uh, there, there's a lot of different strategies that you use, but one of the biggest ones is making them feel successful. Um, so what do I do? Uh, with every client, I will literally track their exercises, sets, reps, weight. And at the end of almost every workout, I will point out to them, look, last workout, you could do um, this exercise for X number of pounds and Y amount of weight or Y amount of reps. Now you can do X plus one. You can do Y plus two. Um, you can, instead of doing 10 reps, you today did 12, but the difficulty hasn't changed. What does that mean? I get them to say it. That means I'm stronger. I'm like, that's correct. Um, so I make them, and I make sure that the progress is almost immediate. Uh, in other words, it's not something you have to wait two or three months to see progress. It's, 
I mean, to, to see weight loss, yeah, that takes uh, time, but strength, endurance, those improve very, very quickly. Literally, when you're a beginner, on uh, every two, three days, you can see progress. When you're more advanced, it slows down, but that's the expectation. So first, make them feel successful, whether that's uh, related to their goal, let's say if it's fat loss, or not related to their goal, maybe they're improving strength or endurance. Um, so first, to make them feel successful. Uh, second, I tie it to their uh, greater goals. In other words, why does somebody want to lose weight? Um, is it just for the number on the scale? Well, no, usually they want to feel more attractive or confident or more energetic. Uh, it's for a different goal. And if you take that things a step further, well, why do they feel more attractive or confident or energetic? Maybe it's because they want to be a better provider for their family. Um, if they're more confident presenting in front of a boardroom, uh, they're going to, they're going to be looked at as, as, you know, more competent. They're going to get the raise that they need. They're going to be able to provide better for their family. Why are they going to be more energetic? Well, maybe it's just to get more stuff done in their day. Maybe they have, um, stuff they want to call. A lot of my clients are retirees. Um, and yet they're very busy in retirement. They're donating their time to, uh, to organizations that they would care about. Um, whether that's children or other seniors or church or synagogue or something else. Um, so you have to connect it to, to connect their progress to something else that really, really matters to them on a, on a very deep level. Um, those are some ways to keep them uh, motivated and accountable. Um, and of course, check-ins in between workouts, in between sessions, uh, because if somebody has a, you know, a 30, 40, 50, 60 year habit of not exercising, getting them to start exercising on a consistent basis is difficult. Uh, not because they want to be difficult, just because it's not part of their routine. So we have to make it a part of their routine, even if it's just a tiny little thing. With me, obviously they're working out, it's probably about an hour, but if they're on their own, I'm happy if they do more than zero. If they are doing a five minute workout, that's better than zero minute workout. Um, and lots and lots and lots of words of encouragement. And again, we, we want them to feel successful. Uh, small success breeds bigger success. Uh, so those are some of the strategies that I use with clients to um, help them stay motivated and stay on track past the past when motivation wears off because motivation is a finite commodity uh yeah. we will we don't want to rely on motivation we want to and we don't want to rely on willpower we want to rely on this is just second nature to me yes for sure and i love how you said you you make them speak what the progress is like you ask them and then they say well i'm getting stronger because it makes them think about yeah. it but then they verbally say it i think that can be exactly. powerful um and then i think that everything you just said can be applied to trainers with clients but then also anyone who's on their own right they can check in with themselves or maybe check in with their accountability people and maybe write down their successes um i think all of that can be applied as like either way yeah yeah exactly so you don't have to have to uh you don't have to have a personal trainer i just use that because that's what i do for a living yeah um but yeah if you have a great accountability partner um you can you do all the stuff with them as well but they can ask you these types of questions uh, how was your workout? What's different about this workout than the last workout? Um, and the more you talk about it, the more you get into it, um, the more you realize, oh, I'm actually making progress. Yeah, for sure. Um, what else? Is there anything else that you want to say or talk about when it comes to successfully starting a health and fitness routine before moving into some hormones? Yeah, um, successfully starting a, a health and fitness routine uh, really just comes down to making it so simple that um, we, I don't know if you guys have this in the States, in, in Canada, we have this commercial, um, a caveman could do it. Um, I think it's a car insurance commercial. Um, but uh, but essentially, that, that's how simple we want to make it. And one um, trick I learned from Dr. John Berardi, the former CEO of Precision Nutrition, a very large nutrition company, is the confidence test. Basically, pick a habit and then ask yourself, on a zero to 10 scale, how confident am I that I can realistically do this habit? Uh, so let's use vegetables as an example. I want to eat seven servings of vegetables per day. On a zero to 10 scale, how confident am I that I can do that? Um, if the answer is anything less than a nine out of 10, make it easier. So in other words, how confident am I that I can realistically do seven uh, servings of vegetables per day? Let's say my confidence is two. Well, well let's make it easier. How about five servings instead of, instead of seven? Well, now it's probably a, a five out of 10. All right, let's make it even easier. How about two servings of vegetables per day? Well, okay, that's a nine. I can easily do that. That's, that's a no-brainer. Cool. That's, that's the starting point. So use the confidence test. Um, better yet, have somebody else ask you um the on the zero to ten scale how confident are you in fill in the blank 
Love that. Yeah, that's some really good advice right there. Yeah. And that goes along with me. Very simple, but also very powerful. Yeah, yes, for sure. So moving into hormones, I in my own health and fitness journey and with training clients have learned the importance of hormones and that they really do and can play a role in, you know, losing weight or just with everything, living a healthy lifestyle. Um, and so first, what, what is, um, how do, how do hormones play a role? Like if you get a client, okay, first back up. (laughs) I have all these questions in my mind right now. So how do hormones play a role in someone's health and fitness journey? Yeah, great question. Uh, To a very, very, very large extent. Right now, there is this giant debate in the fitness and nutrition industry of what's more important, um, hormones or calories? The answer is yes, (laughs) because (laughs) hormones interact with calories and calories interact with hormones. Um, Here's how I phrase it. If we were a perfectly logical computer system with no emotions, no cravings or anything, yeah, calories are king, no question about it. Um, If the calories in are more than the calories out, you gain weight. If it's the opposite, you lose weight. Um, And it sounds simple, but because we have these things called hormones, it makes things way more complex. Um, Hormones change. Um, Where do the calories go? Muscle versus fat. Furthermore, hormones affect our appetite. We may we, we might have this logical spreadsheet of how many calories we eat, what's the breakdown of carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, but our hormones can really hijack that very nice spreadsheet. Uh, so hormones hugely affect uh, how many calories we eat, um, as well as what where are the calories coming from? Are they coming from fat, carbs, or protein? Um, so, yeah, cal- so hormones are hugely important. In that, and that's in, in a healthy person. Now, in a person who's got certain conditions, uh, whether that's PMS, PCOS, uh, menopause, uh, hypothyroidism, et cetera, uh, that can really hijack um, your uh, your desire to eat, your desire and your desire to move. Yep. So it is. it definitely plays a big role. And so how can someone begin to, I don't want to say fix their hormones, but optimize their hormones starting, like if they want to do something starting today, what, what could they do to help with that? Well, the first, the first thing is, um, as a starting point is get tested. Um, there may not be anything to fix. Your hormones may already be optimized. And then the issue is not hormonal. The issue may be psychological, behavioral, emotional, et cetera. Uh, but if you do find that you have certain hormonal imbalances, well, then that, that takes us down a huge rabbit hole of which hormones are out of balance because there is no general hormonal hormone balancing protocol uh different hormones have different specific things that need to be that you we need to balance them um and then if they are out of whack let's figure out which hormones are out of whack and then how to correct different different strategies for different hormones um however having said that one thing that is very often overlooked and yet will help almost every single hormone is just a very basic good restful sleep um think about it this way if you're meant to be spending one third of your life asleep like eight hours a day out of 24 hours if you live to the age of nine you'll spend 30 years asleep uh that's not an accident that's not just idle time that you're just not that you're just chilling um that's actual time when your body and your brain is doing some very very important stuff including balancing your hormones um the the one, one of the one of the central things to hormonal balance is circadian rhythm uh, if your circadian rhythm is off, it'll throw off melatonin. Melatonin will throw off cortisol. Cortisol will throw off the thyroid, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, and others. Um, so if I was to say, to give just general advice, optimize your sleep. Um, go to bed at the same time each night. Keep the, keep the room uh, temperature cool. No electronics in the bedroom. Um, and ideally, wake up um, without an alarm clock. Take whatever your body needs. Now, it, that's if you can do that. Um, if you can't do that, if you have to have, be up at a certain time, then go the other way around. Um, have a set um, wake up time, but a variable go to sleep time. Go to sleep when you feel when you feel sleepy, and then wake up whenever the alarm goes off. But ideally, go to sleep at the same time and then wake up at at a variable time based on what your body needs that day. Yeah, I think that's really important. Getting enough sleep. I remember when I was in my like a little bit younger in college and stuff. I was overworking out but also I would put working out first before sleep until I realized sleep is more important and some people will say you can sleep when you're dead and they'll sacrifice sleep for that hustle life and the grind and workouts um but I think that 
that's false and something that people need to rethink. And by getting more sleep, we can, I feel like that's the root cause, root cause of a lot of issues and health issues and things is to opt to, or is sleep. Would you agree with that? hundred percent. And, and this is from a business perspective for me, remember I make my, my money making people exercise. And even then I say sleep over exercise. Um, so it's in my best interest to say exercise over sleep, but no, like realistically speaking, it's sleep over exercise. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's funny to me that you did mention, uh, when some people say you can sleep when you're dead, fair enough. But if you sleep less, you accelerate that process. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's so true. <laughs> it <laughs> is. Do you find that some people have like when they have a hormonal imbalance, are they similar hormones that people are having imbalanced? Does that make sense? Like, I guess maybe it depends if it's yeah. male and female, but are there certain hormones? Yeah, um, the most common, and keep in mind who, who I work with. Again, uh, women from between 45 and 65. Maybe if I was working with a different population, I'd see different imbalances. But in this age group, the most common imbalances I see are when, of course, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, that's what happens during menopause. But along with that comfort comes, comes for the ride, um, insulin, cortisol, thyroid. Um, in other words, all of them. <laughs> um, and that, that's the most common ones I see with the population that I work with. Um, on occasion, I'll see other hormones that are out of balance, but uh, these would be the most common ones. Uh, but of course, insulin, I'll often see insulin imbalances. That's why I wrote the, uh, the diabetes book. Um, I'll often see imbalances in like lesser known hormones, like like uh, like angiotensin and renin and so on, and that's why I wrote the blood pressure book. Um, but uh, and also because like chronic conditions is my specialty, uh, like diabetes, high blood pressure, arthritis, osteoporosis. Um, I will see imbalances in other hormones, but again, that's the population that I work with, not necessarily who's the general public. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. And so, do you find that once they work on optimizing their sleep, it really helps balance out those hormones? Uh, probably, the thing is- have you, um, have you had clients where you can, you see it and then you see a change with either their physical results or maybe even just their attitude and their mood, all of that? Yeah, I mean, improving sleep will improve a whole lot of things. Like I'm, I'm thinking, what's the least that I can get somebody to do that will have the biggest effect? What's the one domino that knocks over the other dominoes? And very often it's sleep. Um, in other words, if somebody complains, I don't eat right, I don't exercise and I don't sleep well. So I'm thinking, which one can I go after first? Assuming motivation is equal across all three, sleep, um, exercise, nutrition, um, I'll go for it for sleep, for sleep first. And the reason for that is if I get them to sleep better, they have more energy. This way they don't need to get more energy out of food. So they don't, they don't go for the coffees and in of itself, in and of itself, there's nothing wrong with coffee is the stuff you put in it. Um, that's one, that's, that's one example. Another example is if they sleep more, if they sleep restfully, uh, they feel like moving around more, they have more energy to spend, so they exercise. Uh, not only do they exercise, they have more, uh, more energy to give during their exercise, so the intensity is higher. Uh, so that's, that's just like the, the one thing, the one domino that will knock over a bunch of other dominoes. Yeah, totally agree with that. I'm really glad that for myself, I've slowly made the shift from workouts over sleep to sleep is more important than working out. And then I finally okay. started telling my clients that too, like, no, if, like I would have some people come in and they only had three hours of sleep because they have rotating shifts every two weeks. And I'm like, yeah. sleep first, workout later. So yeah. Nice. yeah. And to some extent, it's, it, it is a matter of priorities. Um, I get that when you're just leaving high school, you're not even thinking about the consequences of 30 years down the line when you're choosing your career. Um, so you're thinking, oh, I, I like helping people. I'll be, I'll be a nurse. I'll be a, a personal support worker. I'll be a social worker. Uh, but the hours that you work might be might be completely at odds with your health. Great for your bank account, bad for your health. Um, which is often, unfortunately, people. A lot of my clients are retirees, so they'll wait for retirement to finally address their health. They don't need to be sleeping uh, three or four or five hours a night anymore. They can actually sleep eight hours and at a regular time. Uh, but it's it's sad that sometimes we have to. Um, sacrifice our health for our bank account. Yes, I agree. Mm -hmm. Is there anything, that was all the questions I had about hormones. Um, is there anything that you want to say more on that topic? Um, yeah, I got a lot to say about hormones. Um, Go for it. Are there specific hormones you want to explore? Cortisol, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, thyroid, anything else? Anything specific you're asking? 
Yeah. Um, let me ask, who, uh, what's the age of the um, average listener of your show? Probably, I would say anywhere from 25 to 30. Okay. In that case, they're probably, there's probably a good chunk of them dealing with PCOS, uh, polycystic ovary syndrome. Um, so if you like, we can dive into that one. Yes, that would be awesome. Cool. So with, for, for sure, I'm just going to call it PCOS. Um, so with PCOS, the key imbalances are high insulin, high testosterone, high estrogen, high cortisol, uh, low thyroid. Um, and so how should somebody like that exercise, eat, um, and, uh, and supplement? Um, the first thing I'll say is none of that matters without sleep. So circadian rhythm disruptions are way more common in, in women with PCOS compared to women without PCOS of the same age. Um, and so if you actually look at the literature, you can see the number of people in the general population who have what's called sleep apnea, um, versus women with PCOS who have sleep apnea in the general population. I think it's, I don't quote me on this, but I think it's like 10 to 13%, not, not very high. In women with PCOS, circadian rhythm disruptions and sleep apnea are something like 40 plus percent. So sleep apnea is overrepresented in women with PCOS. So step one, um, if you already know you have you have PCOS, get tested, but not for PCOS as you already know you have it, but get tested for sleep, uh, sleep disturbances. Step, that's step one. Step two, from an exercise perspective, uh, you basically want to exercise like a diabetic. And how should a diabetic be exercising? Um, and diabetics should be doing somewhere between 10 and 15 reps, getting fairly close to muscular failure within one to three reps of muscular failure, um, full body workouts because insulin resistance is a key issue with uh, PCOS. And so only the muscles that are worked become insulin sensitive. So if you have a chest and back day, your chest and back become insulin sensitive, but the rest of the body is insulin resistant. So that's why we wanna do full body workouts as opposed to body part splits. Um, and we want to do so about two or three days of strength training, uh, three to four days of cardio. If you if you are scheduled at four, you that much time. Um, as for cardio, it should be a combination of steady state and intervals, uh, maybe a ratio of like 50-50 um, or possibly slightly more in favor of steady state as opposed to uh, to intervals. That's on the exercise, exercise side of things. On the nutrition side of things, you want to eat like a diabetic uh, because again, insulin resistance is such a huge issue. Um, in women, high insulin will cause high testosterone, but the opposite is true as well. High testosterone will also cause high insulin. Um, so we can just address the insulin because insulin is way more controllable than testosterone. So let's address the insulin issue. How should a diabetic, how should a diabetic eat? Uh, well, the common, common knowledge out there says uh, a diabetic should have a low carb diet. And while I somewhat agree, um, one of the myths that I was busting in my diabetes book is that carbs are the single most important factor for diabetics. They are not, they are the third most important factor. The single most important factor is calories. Total calories are king. And how can you figure out your, your total calories? Um, to maintain your weight, multiply your body weight in pounds by between 15 and 17. So for instance, if somebody weighs 150 pounds, 150 times 15 is 20 to 50. Uh, that's how many calories she needs per day to maintain her weight. Now she wants to decrease her weight. It should be probably somewhere between a 200 and a 500 calorie deficit. Um, so that's, so start there. Calories are king. And the reason I say calories, carbs is because research has been done extensively on what improves insulin sensitivity, calories or carbs. And it's not even questionable that calories are a more important factor. Why? Because by optimizing calories, you will by naturally optimize your carbs because if total calories come down, so will total carbs. The relative carbs might not, but total carbs will. Um, and you can, uh, uh, it, there's a ton of people, both in the literature and in case studies that have reversed diabetes simply by reducing the calories without, without changing the ratio of total carbs to total calories. Um, so calories are king. That's, that's the, mo the mo most important thing. The second most important thing is fiber. Um, fiber is more important than total carbs. And I think the problem with the literature or when people recommend low carbs versus high carbs, they don't distinguish between high fiber carbs and low fiber carbs. People think of fiber as a separate macronutrient. Fiber is not a separate micro macronutrient. Go to any undergrad level nutrition course and they have the same definition of fiber. Fiber is undigestible carbohydrates. 
it's, it's, it's a carbohydrate. It's not protein, it's not fat, it's a carbohydrate. That's what fiber is. And when you look in the literature about the effects of fiber um, augmentation versus carbohydrate restriction, you'll find that the effects of, of uh, fiber augmentation outweigh the, uh, the effects of carbohydrate restriction by three to one. In other words, diabetics have a blood sugar measurement called HbA1c or glycated hemoglobin. Um, high blood sugar, well, HbA1c is considered over 6.0%. Over Increasing fiber, reduces uh, to the right amount, and I'll talk about what that is in a sec, uh, but increasing fiber reduces um, HbA1c by as much as 3%. Now, 3% out of 100 is not very much, but 3% out of 7, 8, 9, that's a ton, that's huge. Um, so fiber, um, fiber augmentation is far superior to carbohydrate restriction because in the literature, they compare high fiber carbohydrates, uh, sorry, high, yeah, high fiber carbohydrates to low fiber carbohydrates. Both of them, decrease their blood sugar on a high carb diet. In other words, both diets eat 65% carbs. One decreases their blood sugar, one doesn't decrease their blood sugar. 65% carbs is a lot of carbs. And yet, why does one decrease their blood sugar and the other one doesn't? Because of the fiber, okay? So fiber is very, very low. So having said that, how much fiber should somebody uh, with PCOS get? Well, somebody without PCOS, it's recommended they get between 25 and 38 grams of fiber per day. Somebody with PCOS, again, should eat like a diabetic. Diabetics will require between, uh, between 35 and 50 grams of fiber per day. And what are the richest sources of fiber? Um, and this is going to be a little controversial, but dried fruits. Dried fruits are a fantastic source of fiber. Now people say, but that's sweet. Why would I have that if I want to lower my blood sugar? Well, two reasons why dried fruits don't actually increase your blood sugar long term. In the short term, yeah, there might be a small spike, but in the long term, they don't. They actually lower your blood sugar. Two reasons. There are three simple sugars. Again, this is very basic undergrad level nutrition. The three simple sugars are glucose, fructose, galactose. That's it. Um, and as you can imagine, glucose raises blood glucose the most. But the primary sugar in fruit is not glucose, it's fructose. Fructose doesn't raise blood sugar to the same amount, uh, to the same extent as glucose and not to the same speed either. That's one. Uh, that's one reason why dried fruits aren't, aren't as bad as, as, as thought. The second reason is because they are dry, the water content is taken out of them, the fiber content is highly concentrated. So they are a powerhouse of fiber. So for that reason, um, they don't really raise blood sugar in the long term. And this is not just my opinion, uh, researchers often wanna test this. So in once the one, it, it, many studies, but one particular one that I used for my, for my diabetes book, in one study, researchers group one uh, gave one group of, of diabetics um, raisins, a small packet of raisins, three times per day for three months. The second group ate the exact same um, meal plan, but without, without the raisins. Um, and what happened after three months is that the diabetic group that didn't get raisins, their blood sugar went up slightly. Um, the group that got the raisins actually lowered their blood sugar ever so slightly, not to a huge extent, but certainly better to lower than to raise. Um, and that's why dry fruits are, are not the problem that they're made out to be. They're a fiber powerhouse. Besides dried fruits, other great fiber sources are, are, are seeds. So flax seeds, chia seeds, hemp seeds, pectin, psyllium, stuff like that, uh, buckwheat, quinoa, um, beans, peas, lentils, stuff like that. Those are your richest fiber sources, um, as well as the berry family, raspberries, blackberries, blueberries, um, cranberries, and so on. Uh, those would be your best bets for fiber. And only the third most important variable is carbohydrates, okay? So again, to, to sum up, that the most important thing for uh, blood sugar management is calories. The second most important thing is fiber. And then down, way, way, way down the line is carbohydrates. And even further down the line is glycemic index. Um, the jury's still out on whether the glycemic index matters at all. Uh, but uh, essentially, that's how somebody with uh, PCOS should be eating. Um, and since I approach everything from a four-pronged perspective, uh, sleep, exercise, nutrition, and supplements. Which supplements do we want to take if we have PCOS? Um, the ones that help us uh, improve our insulin and our testosterone status. Uh, two of the most powerful ones, one is called milk thistle, and we want to be doing that three, uh, three times a day, about 500 milligrams. Um, and the other one that's particularly helpful for PCOS is something called NAC or NACL cysteine, uh, between one and three times per day, 500 milligrams as well. Uh, between those, the, all, 
like those entire strategies of sleep, nutrition, um, exercise, and supplements, um, a lot of women can actually get their hormones back, lower their testosterone, lower their insulin, uh, raise their, uh, improve their thyroid, and of course, improve all the, the things that, the unpleasant things that PCOS causes, like excess hair growth starts to go away, fertility may return, and of course, body fat will be lost, fat will be, will be redistributed back from the belly down to the buns and thighs, et cetera. Um, and if you approach it from a comprehensive or a holistic perspective, you can get better results than just trying one thing here and there. Mm -hmm. Wow. I just learned a lot. That was amazing. <laughs> That's that PCOS crash course. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Anyone with PCOS will need to go back and listen and take notes. That was amazing. You were just a wealth of knowledge. I love it so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I don't have to go into more detail, but I know we're, we're limited on time. <laughs> yeah. No, that was so good though. I'm glad that you went into that. Um, cool. If, um, okay, so anyone who does have PCOS, they need to focus on with their nutrition, right? Is that like kind of the step one is what is like, what, like kind of give a couple of steps if someone has PCOS and the step one that they should do or like the top, like three things that they can do to like from today moving forward. Yeah. Number one, sleep. <laughs> yes. Um, and when I say sleep, I don't just mean uh, what somebody with non-PCOS does, just go to bed on time and wake up uh, with an alarm clock. PCOS, get tested for sleep apnea. That's number one. Uh, if you have sleep apnea, get a CPAP machine or get some kind of treatment for sleep apnea. That's by far number one. Um, number two, um, in terms of impact nutrition, um, optimize your calories and your fiber. Number three, exercise. Um, ideally three or three to six days per week. And lower on the priority list is take supplements the, the either one or both of the ones that I mentioned. Yep. Love that. And then also it's like consistently, um, how long does it take for not necessarily results, but for things to be improved, like for anyone who has PCOS? Yeah. Great question. Um, I guess it depends on what, what kind of results are we looking for? Are we talking about fat loss, fertility, um, like decreasing of the unwanted hair growth, et cetera. Um, as far as fat loss is concerned, I guess it depends on the severity of the caloric restriction. Uh, the more you restrict, the faster the faster uh, progress comes. So it's hard to put a number on that because there, there's, a, there's a range there. Um, as for like the return of fertility, usually about two or three menstrual cycles. Um, so somewhere around two and a half to three months. Um, as for the loss of unwanted hair growth, um, that, that, that's a tricky one that the variability in there is ridiculous from like, it's never going to happen unless, unless you get some specific skin treatments, uh, to just a few weeks. Okay. Awesome. Good. Good to know. As for, by the way, as for more, more energy levels that can happen very, like really fast, like two, three, four weeks. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. So, well, this, our time was amazing. I learned a lot and, I do have one last question. This is something that I like to ask my guests just because I, it's, I just like to hear different perspective from people. So my podcast is called flow with the grow. So when you hear that, what comes to mind for you? Um, that's a great question. Um, to kind of effortlessly go along with never ending progress. Love that. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. That a good answer. <laughs> yes, it is. Everyone has something cool. completely different every single time. I love it. So, um, okay. Well, if someone is wanting to know more about you or wanting to work with you or just wanting to, more information or to learn from you, what, where can someone go? Uh, th uh, thank you for, for asking. Um, why I'm, I'm terrible at social media. I'm like an 80 year old with technology, but, um, if somebody wants a free, uh, PDF copy of my book, stop exercising the way you're doing it now, uh, just visit my website, fitness solutions plus.ca slash stop exercising. And they can pick it up there. Um, and that'll also give them my newsletter as well, which is free. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. I will link that in the show notes too. So someone can check that out. Um, did you have anything else you wanted to say or any questions for me? No. Uh, well, actually I have a, a question for you is what did you mean with flow with the girl? Great question. So for me, it's really just to flow with the ups and downs of life. And with that comes growth. Like essentially that's kind of what it comes down to is we all have ups and downs, but that all is growth and then to learn to flow with it. Oh, okay. Well, that's beautiful. 
Thank you. I appreciate that. And I appreciate your time today. I look forward to having this out. I'll let you know when it comes out. And yeah, hope you have a good rest of your day. My pleasure. I love chatting about this and thank you so much for having me on. Yeah, thanks. Bye. See you later.